Hi, now I'm with Professor Eugene Soltis. is the Jacuzzi Family Associate Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, where his research focus how individuals and organizations confront and overcome challenging situations. Professor Soltz works on corporate misconduct and fraud culminated in the book. Professor, so what do you think uh, have, uh, you have researched in so many cases about the white collar criminal? What do you think of them? Because they are making uh, a huge amount of money, right? Welcome to Dr. Sonia Wibisono YouTube channel. Jangan lupa klik subscribe, klik subscribe. Karena subscribe itu gratis. Klik like, klik like, klik share, share. Agar teman-teman bisa dengar juga manfaatnya. Klik lonceng, gambar lonceng. Silahkan komentar sebanyak-banyaknya. And corruption around the world is a major challenge. At least what I've spent a lot of time focusing on is, you know, why individuals engage in this conduct. And where I particularly focus on is it's a, a the norms and an underlying intuitions that, that motivate people. Okay. And what I find is that it's not so much how it's sometimes depicted as the bad apple or the kind of evil villain, but rather what I find is that these are a lot of would be otherwise um, upstanding businessmen and women that that see the surrounding culture and the surrounding environment and what they think of their actions it doesn't actually feel so harmful um okay. <laughs> and and that becomes a much more challenging issue where it's not the bad apple that we can separate out but rather uh, we all have under the right circumstances i think the ability to be compromised so is it including corrupt yes so including corruption so i spend a lot of time uh, for example things like uh, you know bribery. bribery and how people you know around the world and you know, whether we're talking about, you know, firms, multinational firms going yes. into an area and trying to win a deal and paying paying a minister off um, yeah. to actually, uh, you know, giving someone a little something on the side so they win the contract rather than some other firm. It's including in the white collar crime. Yes, in white collar. Okay. Um, I mean, there are areas, especially when we start thinking about corruption, um, where, you know, the United States actually um, is one of the most, I'll say, aggressive countries in terms of prosecuting uh, corruption uh, or Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. But most of those cases actually occur outside the United States. Um, the 10 largest fines actually for the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, only one of them is actually an American firm. Oh, okay. uh, the rest is are actually foreign firms that have some connection. Uh, maybe it's a stock exchange, maybe it's a bank account, um, connection to the United States. What do you think about Indonesia? Because we have a lot of corruption in the politics area. Yeah. It's an area where a lot of firms, I'll say a lot of multinational air, uh, firms have gotten into trouble um, because it's an area where I think firms have the sense in, in, I think that they can come in and follow the, I'll say, certain kinds of, let's say, global rules around uh, what's expected. Like a, a minister, they're, they're not going to give them anything. Um, and what they learn is they can't win the contract locally, and so they end up doing, and we see this is what's leading to some of the challenges. But I think that makes it also too easy to make this a black and white Um because I think a lot of people, and what I spend a lot of time finding is that a lot of people find other ways to achieve it. So uh, let's give a hypothetical, is you decide you don't want to give that person, uh, that local minister, a, you know, $10,000 to to get to have the building site. But what happens if you build a, a new school? Well, on the one hand, the new school sounds like a very nice thing for the community, and it genuinely is. But you're building a new school not because you want to build a school, but because the school will allow that minister to say, we have a new school in our area, people are happy, comfortable, and be reelected. And so there's a lot of ways that, I'll say, what we think of corruption occurs. Yes. And it's not always suitcases of money. Yes. I think actually some of the more significant, uh, especially as we go around the world, occurs in the softer way, where they're mixed motives. One of it is building a school is great. On the yes. other hand, you're only building a school because you want to corrupt a minister uh, yes. toward your contract. It's difficult there sometimes in the gray area. Yeah, and this is the great, and as I see a lot of good management, they sit there and they realize if they build the school, something they can, it perfectly fine, it's very reasonable to do, they can sit there and actually say, well, the reason I'm doing this is because I, I really care about the community and I want to build the school. And so they convince themselves that they're doing it for that reason even though they're really doing it for some other reason. And I think this is where these mixed intentions yes. um, oftentimes arise. And also in businesses, there are a lot of business that can be a white collar crime, such as like a, mon a money business or money game 
or like multi level also which which business that you think is like a white collar business <laughs> I white mean front? yeah I mean if we start talking about money laundering because we can go on the spectrum and you know I spend when I think of white collar crime I I think of it as individuals who would otherwise um, be you know successful managers and entrepreneurs that engage in some kind of conduct in a business context. Um, but, you know, money laundering. Um, I mean, there are many major banks uh, that have actually faced very serious money laundering for money laundering for uh, cartels. And that's certainly a white collar crime. There's a lot of also very scary organizations when we start thinking about certain kinds of gangs and that, that also launder money. I don't really see that as white collar anymore. That's just part of a, a criminal organization. But that borderline um, actually becomes quite gray. But uh, yeah, certainly money laundering, the multi-layer, which um, sometimes those are pyramid schemes or Ponzi yes, schemes. Yes, Ponzi schemes. Yeah. How um, do we know and prevent uh, us from investing on the money money scheme uh, project? Yeah, the money, uh, the multi-layer is really hard because a lot of those rely on people that work for the company also buying the products and yes. reselling it to people. That's literally how they work. It's a multi-labor marketing. Yes. The distinction between that and a pyramid scheme oftentimes is a very fine line. If more of your employees are buying your the product than non-employees for a short period of time, we could say that's just part of the multi-level process and that's a temporary situation. If that occurs forever, then that's a pyramid scheme um, where you're literally Pay, kind of having one group pay out another in order to keep it going. Is it um, dangerous? Yeah, and so this is where we, we see people, I think, get sucked into these, oftentimes un, unwittingly. Um, and, and I think this is where uh, where we see people lose a lot, where it's not um, you know just some abstract and, and uh, bank or investor having some people lose some money on a stock, a stock exchange. But a lot of times we'll see people be really devastated by, by some of these schemes. Yeah, there are a lot of like rich people also that I... Uh, I see the movie and it's in your uh, maybe in your thesis also like the Murdoch family, yeah, which are they are very convincing, but they mm -hmm. do it also. I mean, there's a lot of, and I think this is again going to like the, the group norms and surrounding norms. Um, you know, people people in you know certain kinds of wealthy situations of how they're able to con construe or or see a particular situation. Also, the support that they can give. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of criticism, I'll say, around the world that senior executives are not held accountable. Um, when when major crimes occur, the firm might be held accountable or some low-level employees, but how come the senior people are never held accountable? Oftentimes, it's because there's many, many, many layers where the person on the top actually never pushes the button, never types the email. People know that he or she knew, but because there isn't the evidence that he or she actually did it, um, they're let off the hook. Okay. Oh, so they cannot be... Uh, they need uh, evidence. I mean, anywhere I think we go in the... No matter where we go in the world, and while you know the justice standards are different in different places, generally we can say where, where the whole world does agree uh, and in legitimate places of the world is you need evidence to hold people accountable. Yes, yes. And if you don't have evidence, which if you don't send the email, you don't make the phone call, you never tell someone to do that. You just say, get it done. I mean, that's kind of the classic. I tell my subordinate that just get it done. I don't care how you do it. Just get it done. You know, on one hand, you could say, I don't care how you do it. Just get it done. I could, I'm saying you should engage in fraud. If you ever find that person later and they're put on the defense, they would say, of course, I meant any way you can. That doesn't mean you engage in fraud. That simply means you should try really hard. And so there's lots of ways of changing and, and adjusting how these uh, uh, allegations are made. And also, how we as a businessman not being uh, really not want to become like this white collar fraud. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's very tempted, right? How to uh, prevent that uh, temptation to not doing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the. Um, I have in my book a couple. I think the examples that made uh, have made a. I'll say a strong point on me is that many of the times where you see people starting to go down what we call the slippery slope. They're, they're starting to go from uh, more and more aggressive behavior to behavior that it would be potentially uh, illegal or have serious reputational consequences. It's where they have a, a, a spouse, a girlfriend, or, or a friend kind of come in and actually tell them, hey, th that's, that's kind of weird. Um, I'm expressing what I'm doing with all this pride, 
But when I'm explaining it to my my spouse, uh, uh, she was, you know, that doesn't sound like something that you should be comfortable with. And then you're taken back. Oh, so it's finding people that you can actually trust, that you can actually get different points of uh, view. Yeah. Um, because I think so often we're surrounded by people that are like us. I, I make the point that we spend a lot of time here in the business school talking about cases with around some of these complex ethical issues. But most of the time, they're not that difficult to solve in class because we give you a case, we identify the situation, we spend an hour discussing it, and we do it in a group uh, of 100 people with different views and opinions. In most instances, when these actual kind of misconduct occurs, no one has isolated that decision from the thousands of others that are made throughout the course of a day. Uh, you're going to make decisions very quickly. And you're going to make the decision maybe alone or with people that think exactly like you. Mm. And that's the hard part. We need to make real decisions a little bit more like those made in the classroom where you can think back and you get different points of view and you can actually struggle. Um, we don't have that yes. in most of the corporate world. Yes. How do you get that support system? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. It's like, who are those people that offer that, that, that can be someone that you actually genuinely trust and genuinely respect their, their point of view and their, their pushback? Yeah, maybe like an organization of the like entrepreneur organization that can help each other. I, I would love to think that people could find, you know, relationships within that with, that could act in that, that way. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, what often happens is people join organizations that are supposed to do that, but rather they find people that will simply rationalize and justify okay. rather than kind of give them a nudge saying, you know, what, have you thought about this or have you thought about the risk associated with that? Um, yes. I oftentimes, uh, and uh, there's an amazing scholar at NYU who's made the point that reason oftentimes looks like a, a lawyer defending a client, not a scientist seeking the truth. Okay. And I think that's a lot of time what those are closest around us. They're supposed to be our supporters. They're our cheerleaders. They're <laughs> like our, our lawyers defending us. Oftentimes, that's not what we need. What we need is a scientist who's actually kind of probing, okay. trying to to help us see the world a little bit differently and help us expose these risks before they become more significant. So you have to have that in your family or your yeah. company. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, precisely. And how if uh, somebody wants to go back to a good good way if they already do this crime? Mm -hmm. Is there any turning back way? It's, it's very rarely that the person engaged in misconduct tried to separate and then five years later it gets picked up. Um, that's pretty rare, and and, and uh, you say I, I empathize on those cases where people want to get out of it and and then couldn't like couldn't. Most time, what you actually do see is that it's a slippery slope that it gets worse and worse and worse. Yes, yes. And actually, rather when the person gets caught, rather than saying I made mistakes and I'm going to face punishment associated with that, you cover it up even more. So you destroy yes, documents, you destroy email, you create right. obstruction charges, and then it made a bad situation much much worse. And I think that's what commonly happens is yes. so to the extent we, we've all made from childhood to now that we're adults, we all make mistakes. And some of those can actually be significant. I think what we have to be as adults, you know, grown up enough to say we make mistakes. We sometimes are going to be facing punishment associated with that. But we don't want to make it worse. Uh, we don't want to make the problem any worse. And but that's so often what happens. Yeah, that's very difficult, actually. Yeah, yeah it, and it's naturally hard. Someone shows up and accuses you. Our natural thing is to say, no, you're wrong, to deflect or ignore. Um, I think it's very hard to, uh, and I've reflected this on some of the cases, that if if you know something's wrong with your organization and you're doing well, you live in a, a nice house, um, you have a great family, um, you have a lot of income where you can take the trips and, and support your kids in the way that you want, and you come home on Friday Friday evening and you're not comfortable because you know you're making that money in ways that are not appropriate. You say, I don't want next week to be like this. I, I realize I need to, you know, blow the whistle, so to speak. I need to stop this. I need to end this business. I might need to disclose something to regulators to, or to investors. It's going to be messy. What happens is you start on Monday, you go into work and you're like, you know what? You think of your nice house, your wonderful family, the comfort. <laughs> and you say, you know what? I, I'm not comfortable. Next week I'll do that. And then every week goes by and it takes something that could have stopped earlier and now it's extended for months and years later and it's only become more serious and worse. Yeah, it's very difficult. And that's human nature. That's nothing yes. about some fraud. I think we all, we, we don't want that pain today. Yes. We just want a little bit more of our nice, comfortable time. And if we can delay that, we'd rather delay it. Yes. 
What do you think about the forex trading? Is it including I, the white collar crime? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, what's fascinating when I see these cases uh, in forex and, and and LIBOR, like these are these are cases in which obviously it's across a whole industry, and it's serious because these are benchmarks that all of us use no matter where we are. This affects home mortgages, interest rate, uh, like anytime we take a loan, um, anytime we're exchanging money. Um, but let me take a slightly different view of it, and that is the people who are involved. And I imagine myself, suppose I was an MBA student. I just graduated from a top business school and I enter one of these banks uh, on one of these trading desks. I look around, I see what my boss is doing, my managing director and the people who've been there for several years. And this is how they operate in the market. I then look at our other major banks and you know what? They're doing the exact same thing. Yes. <laughs> how am I going to behave? I'm going to say, I want to be like them. I want to be like the managing director on my desk. I want to maybe go to a different bank and work at this other, even more prestigious bank. I'm going to end up patterning myself after their behavior. And so this is where I think the hard part is why we see norms. No one, no one was destined to engage in any of that kind of conduct. But inevitably what happens when you're surrounded by that, you pick up those, those in kind of intentions. Okay. So what kind of misconduct that is uh, often happen? in the business area? Uh, uh, I'll give two categories. I mean, if we're starting to think about crimes, I think bribery is actually probably one of the most significant. And I'll say corruption and how that occurs in the many, many different ways. And sometimes it's a very small, innocuous way that by giving someone effectively a tip, we're able to kind of jump the line to the kinds of more serious things where the reason why my company is operating or wins some contract with a major government contract even though I, I'm not as good at it, uh, I'm not as effective, I'm more expensive, I win it because I've corrupted. I'm, I'm ripping off taxpayers because of that. Um, so corruption and, and bribery more broadly. The other, which is, I'll say, a much broader class, which is, I think, of truth-telling more broadly. Uh, I mean, I think this is as small as when an entrepreneur is doing a, their first venture capital pitch, and they need to tout their business a little bit because they're just desperately trying to get off the ground and make some money. You know, so you kind of push the truth a little bit. Um, I mean, that starts when companies are the small inception of the company, and that kind of oftentimes just grows and grows and grows over time. Um, it's kind of like Pinocchio. It just keeps getting longer and longer. And I think figuring out what's the difference between, I'll say, white lies. Um, yes. So when my <laughs> four-year-old asks if that dress looks nice on her, and I know it, it looks wonderful, even though it, it doesn't go, Um where that's okay yes. to the kinds of things where if someone asks you, uh, you know, is, is is this what you, is this the um, set of suppliers that you have? And you say, yes, of course, even though you have an email, you've had a conversation, but they're not actually your suppliers, but you kind of fib it to kind of fake it until you make it. Um, and we see a lot of successful firms. I mean, there are a whole host of businesses, you know, many of the kind of, I think, multi-billion dollar firms that we see today, the unicorns which actually in their inception were not legal businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of had to grow kind of, they, they, they seek to grow fast enough and get enough customers such that the regulation will kind of catch up to their business model. Okay. It's difficult. So uh, can you have any advice for our president? Because our new president, Jokowi, is very clean and he wants the country to be clean from corruption and mm -hmm. he have some good ministers, but so the corruption is like really in the roots of everywhere in the in the government system because our country mm -hmm. is very big and we have a lot of islands and it's separated. So all the uh, lower layer is already common with this uh, corruption situation. It's very difficult. Yeah, I mean, that's the right stuff. We start tone from the top and the people. I mean, the hard part is the incentives. Like, why do people take bribes? Like, why would people take money? I mean, if they don't have the right incentives in place. And this is a hard problem is that to the extent people are not paid well. Um, they're not sustained. That the, the only way, and there's a lot of places around the world where the only way you can be a government kind of local official with the kind of the lowest layer, you're not paid well enough to really, like, live. And so you, you almost empower people to take bribes because that's how you actually make your living. And so I think this is trying to figure out what's the system of incentives that we can design such that people uh, can actually have these jobs and do their jobs effectively without needing to take bribes. Oh. Um, and I think that that's a much harder harder thing because that's money and that's cost. Yeah. And you need to deploy that. But this is step one of getting, you look around from the top of the leadership because people will follow um, the people above them. If the people above you are, are 
towing the line and, and not accepting bribes and, and saying this is not how we... And, and actually taking action. When they find someone that is taking a bribe, they don't overlook it, maybe as it was done in the past, but they take serious action. These people are censured or they're fired. Um, they're called out by the media. Um, people learn that that's how, it, it, you know, it happens. And I'll say, you know, a country we've looked at the last several years that have changed dramatically, China, in their, in their anti-corruption kind of crackdown. Yes. I mean, they've taken really serious, you see very, very senior people um, be in prison for, you know, decades uh, associated. And they, I mean, the fall from grace is extraordinary. And you've seen that, I mean, you see that show up in the data of luxury, everything from like luxury watches to luxury cars, like that market has changed. And I think it's a response to the perceived world that you can't be a minister in China and actually engage in these activities anymore. Um, if we find you, we will punish you and we're going to punish you very heavily. Um, so I think that's fun. It's not just a, it's not just talking about we don't corruption. I mean, talk is very cheap. What you want is actions, uh, creating the right incentives for people and then simultaneously actually holding people to account when they are caught. Because it's like going to drag a lot of important, famous people from the, from that's, the past. <laughs> that's, and that's the hard part. And I think there's oftentimes a desire we can move forward, but we can kind of forget and that's hard um, because there's a, a lot of baggage oftentimes yes. in the past. Um, yes. And so finding that, that balance and way to go forward is hard. But, um, you know, I think I think as we see in the future, in, in the longer run, in the short run, bribery, corruption, it doesn't seem to be that costly. It's one of these things. But over the long run, it becomes a massive drag. You have inefficient firms, inefficient people and le- lower performing people winning contracts, um, which is ultimately holding down the progress and, and uh, opportunity uh, for, for, a, for uh, a country and its people. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Sol. Really, my, my pleasure. Pleasure okay. to join you today. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the yeah. advice.